But I am pleased to be joined by Dan Bruder. He is the co-founder and CEO of Blendification. And Dan, I'm going to hand things over to you to kick it off. Okay. Thanks, Lindsay. Glad to be here. Um, so here today, we're going to talk about AI's challenge to business planning and strategy leadership. And, and I put this in here. It says, it says embrace or be replaced. Um, at the top of this, this is not a conversation about AI and all the things that AI can do. Um, well, I'm going to say this several times throughout this discussion is this is a specifically focused AI application or use case around strategy and business planning. So um, most of the times we get people on AI panels or conversations, we get we, we start talking about all the different use cases for AI. And many times we walk out of there uh, from a business side saying, that's really cool. I can plan my vacation, but I don't know how to use it in my business. How can I apply this to my business today? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about today is we're going to go through a, a, a process or a sequence to show you how you can apply AI in your business today, what tools are available and some specific applications. So I will have one little bit of a fun exercise to show you some, some of the growth in technology, but for the most part, this is all around one specific use case, and that is business or strategy planning as it relates to your company. So um, again, my name's Dan Bruder. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Blendification. We've been around for several years, but we've reinvented ourselves several times. We've recently reinvented ourselves into an AI application, software application that helps businesses um, combine company and employee focus through a, a platform of software. So anyway, what are we going to do today? Why are we here? What's the, So basically, let's just begin with the end in mind here. And, and that is specifically, we're going to uh, go through a process and hopefully at the end of this, you understand the, evo the, the evolution and the changing landscape of strategic planning and execution, because, you know, really what we plan tends to happen. And if we don't evolve our planning, then it's less likely um, or more likely that we're not going to experience great change in the business. So hopefully we can open our eyes to some of that stuff. I hope you guys walk out of here and you contemplate how the use of AI can improve your business and or your strategic planning, whatever you want to call it. And then again, consider how strategy leaders can adopt technology to improve outcomes, because essentially that's what we're trying to do here is adopt strategy or excuse me, adopt technology to improve various different outcomes. So with that said, um, quick little overview. I've got really four steps here that we're going to go through today. Um, first, we're going to do a brief history of strategy. Um, then part two, we'll go into this idea of this quantum leap in technology. Um, this by no means is a moderate advance in technology. And I would argue that this is potentially the biggest leap in the biggest technological advancement our human race has ever experienced in a short period of time. And um, so I'll set that up and, and hopefully I can back that up a little bit. That's a pretty strong statement. So um, on the other side of this too, the part three would be looking at artificial intelligence, AI, and how it relates to strategy right now. And then we'll look a little bit into the future and say, what does what can strategy do? Um, and a bigger role than planning is really where I'm going with that. It's bigger than just planning. So let's start out with part one, brief history of strategy. So part one, and here's a slide here, the origins of strategy. And um, uh, I, I teach strategy at, uh, at at the university, the MBA, executive MBA level, um, and I've been doing it for years. So um, I'm going to go into a little bit of an academic side. I think it's kind of fun to look at the origins of strategy. Where does it come from? And, you know, a lot of people point back to the art of war from Sun Tzu. And, and that says the highest form of warfare is defeating the enemy without actually fighting. And art, in this case, the art of war is really strategy. So um, that's kind of an interesting, so, so that means it's not really fixed. And then we come up with, uh, um, up to uh, Nicola uh, Machiavelli, and we all know Machiavelli around deception, people that are deceptive or dishonest. We, we call them Machiavellian. Um, but, but, but the Machiavellian, um, that, that, that phrase came out of never attempting to win by force, what can be won by deception? So um, there's more to that because he's talking about, um, Nicola's talking about, this in the context of war. So how do we deceive people in order to avoid fighting with them 
and essentially killing people. And that goes back, there's a little bit of a connection to the art of war there. And then we have Karl von Clausewitz, where he said, no plan survives the first contact with the enemy. So um, a couple little uh, highlights here, art. Um, when we talk about strategy being an art, that means it's variable. Um, sometimes we don't plan our business as though it's variable, but when we're doing strategy, there, there's a variable element to it. The deception side is how do we outmaneuver others? How do we outmaneuver our competition, so to speak? Um, that's another phrase or term or definition of deception. And then looking at what Carl von Kloschwitz said, um, the no plan survives. That means we have to have agility because we all know that any plan we had at the beginning of uh, 2020 most likely wasn't really valid uh, at the end of the first quarter or March 30th of 2020. So there needs to be an element of variability, the ability to outmaneuver others and have some agility within a plan. And if our plan doesn't have that or our execution model doesn't have that, it's likely our strategy won't succeed. So going with uh, that same theme, here's a more modern interpretation of what I just um, put up there. Some of you might recognize this, especially those that come from my generation. That's Mike Tyson, who said that everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And anyone that's leading a business or leading planning or part of uh, or, or really just doing anything, uh, an account manager by any stretch, realizes that sometimes we go into situations with a really good plan, but then they're changed pretty rapidly. So sticking with this theme of the origins, the strategy, the history of strategy, um, strategy is kind of a, a big deal in business today, but where did it come from and why is it that way? It was really the 1960s that businesses started looking at this concept of strategic planning or business planning. And it started going wild with businesses in the 60s, but then it was also picked up by the consulting industry and then academia picked it up. And now we had this triage um, of uh, focus on strategy with business, academia and consulting. And the concept of strategy within business started taking off. And we started seeing in the 70s various different frameworks that came up. Some of you might be familiar with the BCG matrix. Um, that, that's where we got the term cash cow. Uh, and, and BCG is the Boston Consulting Group. And, uh, you know, one of the largest consulting companies in the world focusing primarily on strategy. Some of you might have heard of quarters five or scenario planning. But what we started seeing in the 70s were some frameworks for strategic planning for businesses really being pushed by consultants. And it really took off. And then over the subsequent years after that, we started seeing more frameworks, PESTEL. Many of you do SWOT analysis, or we should say SWOT charts. Um, you've probably heard of Blue Ocean Strategy, Balance Scorecard, OKRs, Value Chain Analysis, all these different things. They're, they're, they're frameworks. Um, personally, I look at all of these and they all add a some value but at the same time, none of them on their own is really complete. Um, but over time, we started seeing strategy becoming marketable and uh, frameworks coming up. And, and that's kind of the history of strategy. And that's where we are today. There's, there's some frameworks out there. And truthfully, I went back to the 60s. And this is a really short part of the, the presentation because there's not a whole lot of dramatic advancement in strategy over the past, what, that's 50, 60 years. Um, let me slow down for a second here um, and look at my timeline here. So I graduated from college in uh, 1989. I know that surprises a lot of you, even though you can only see me on video here. But um, I graduated with an, uh, and I had an undergrad capstone strategic planning class, and I thought it was really cool. I got a graduate degree um, in 1995, and then in 2000, I started, um, I started with Marriott before this, but I started uh, in a more formal role in strategic planning with the uh, Marriott organization. Now, in, uh, before Marriott, I was actually a banker. Uh, my first career was in banking. I was credit trained at a bank that obviously no longer exists. Um, but it was down in Florida. And I was credit trained. I was a retail. I was, did retail banking. I was in commercial real estate lending for quite a while, for a little bit. Um, cash management. Uh, let's see. Going back, I um, I also was president of a community bank for a period of time before I decided to jump out of the banking space and into the world of vacations. 
and that was Marriott. But then that was really the introduction to strategic planning. And at Marriott, we used the balance scorecard um, for part of our strategic planning, which was really cool. So that's in 2000. And then all the way up to 2008, I started a, a consulting practice in 2008. Coincidentally, that was one of the worst markets we've ever experienced. Um, personally, my wife and I decided we wanted to live in Colorado rather than um, chase the corporate path with Marriott. Great organization, but we made a life, um, a kid's uh, decision rather than a career decision. But that wasn't really good timing, by the way, because 2008, the market crashed. So I started strategy consulting, but it wasn't until 2012 until I had kind of a major aha when I was teaching strategy at Colorado State University at the MBA level and then later on in the executive MBA level, I realized that strategy can be so much more than just a plan. And I started realizing that the way that we were doing strategy within business and within academia, there really wasn't a comprehensive look and a way to connect all the pieces of a business and the people. And I started seeing strategy as this huge opportunity to not only plan better, but also connect human beings to the company. And that evolved into this concept of blendification. And that's connecting human beings, employees to the business. And the best platform for doing that, in my opinion, is strategy. And then it's reinforced with several other tactical things. But if our plan doesn't really incorporate the people, how do we expect the people to be engaged in the business? So that's what led to blendification. And today we're at a, what I, have to, I think is a, um, a real drastic uh, change in, um, in business and um, obviously in planning. So I'm going to go on to part two, which is today and the quantum leap that we're experiencing um, with strategic planning, but I'm only applying the technology to strategic planning. There's several other things we're experiencing that this can be applied to. So looking at this chart, if you look at this, it's kind of a basic chart. You see down at the bottom, we have 1970s, in the 1970s. And if you go back to my history in the 1970s, 60s is really when this strategy thing took off. We've experienced kind of an incremental growth in the capabilities around business planning or strategic planning and execution capabilities. And then all of a sudden, today, something happened. Boom, everything just went like that. And we're experiencing some significant uh, growth or opportunities for growth, or I call it a quantum leap. I didn't make that up. So I went and looked at what does quantum leap mean? We use that word, or I use that word, and it's a significant and often sudden advance or change. And I think that's where we are right now. And what we're about to experience for those that embrace this change is exponential growth in our business, in our contribution to the business and our ability as human beings to connect to something meaningful through our business and include others. I see all that coming together right now. And um, not, to, not to overwhelm what we're talking about, but that I think is what we have now is we have a significant opportunity. So stepping back again, so business strategic planning, how we used to do this, or I'd say how we're currently doing this in a lot of cases, very manual process. The leadership team comes together. It creates a rigid plan. Sometimes people only do planning once every three years, which it just blows my mind um, because the, the rate of change outside the business is so rapid. We have to create a process inside the business that matches the rate of change outside the business. So the, the leadership team creates a rigid strategic plan. The C-suite gets together and does that. And then they take that strategic plan or the, the highlights of it, and they share that direction with other people. And that creates a top-down type accountability model. Here's what we're doing. You go do it, right? And, um, and that's, what, how, that's how a lot of people do this. I'm not suggesting everybody does, but that's the dominant theme in strategic planning today. And then, boom, everything changes today. What can we do now? What is the opportunity in strategic planning? And that is the ability to create an agile plan with the whole team. So think about this for a second. That's a key element. Usually the leaders get together and the C-suite comes up with a plan, right? That doesn't change to some extent, but now we can actually include the whole team in that process. And the whole team, I mean more than 10 people, more than 20, more than 100, 
you know, even thousands if we want. Um, and that's the whole team. And then rather than sharing the direction, we create a shared direction. And that's what we're looking for. Shared ownership of the company's future. And then rather a rather than a top down accountability model, we create peer responsibility. We we stop using the word accountability and we start using the word responsibility because I don't know about you as a as a person, one as a leader, and then one that is being led, I don't like holding people accountable. I don't wake up in the morning and say, boy, I just look forward to holding Susie accountable today. And nor does the person on the other side. I don't like being held accountable, but I am, I do take pride in a level of responsibility. So if we could take um, this term or this theme of responsibility and put it within the organization, I think we've got a winning model. So let's look at where we are. Um, you know, this is a pretty basic model. We have a straight line. And then I think we're right here, right at the beginning of a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos. And that's where we are right now. And the question is, why are we here? And I would say it's because of artificial intelligence. And that goes back to my early statement about artificial intelligence potentially being the most drastic technological advancement our people have ever seen. And I'll say that, um, let me qualify that for a second. So some of you might be, you know, if we were in person right now, you'd be throwing something at me. So I apologize. I, I don't mean to offend anybody. But artificial intelligence, if we look at where we are, the internet took at a minimum 10 years to adopt, you know, the adoption rate. Go back to the industrial revolution. Um, there was a long, there were decades, there was a period of decades of time for the adaptation of that change. Um, and so each time we have a technological shift or a shift industry wise or something like that, the, 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 the time from start to adoption has been getting lower and lower and lower. So right now with this AI piece, there's so much being written about it. Um, there's so much out there, but the adoption phase or the adoption time frame from the beginning to the end is going to be much less than that of the Internet. And that could be, I don't want to put any crazy predictions out there, but people are already adapting to and embracing the technological shift that we're seeing right now. And again, that took a longer time with the internet. So this time frame is much shorter. The, technologi the technological capability to learn and change is much faster. So this window that we have now is going to be um, lead to some chaos um, mostly in the business side, and that's where I look at it. So I'm going to go through a, a couple background videos here. And uh, basically, this part of it is just to discuss a little bit about um, not what gener generative AI is, but just so you see the change over, over the last year, where we've come from in less than a year to where we are today. This is a technological shift that I'm just trying to substantiate through a couple little background videos here. So old school generative AI, and we've all seen this. And if we look at, you know, our, our first exposure to this really, this generative AI concept was when Google started predicting what we were typing, the last three or four words. So I put this this statement in here, what should bankers be prepared for with AI technology? And if you were following that at the bottom, what it was doing, it was predicting what the next words should be based on what I just said, you know, predictive um, analytics, basically. So it was taking language and then predicting what was next. You know, that was easy when we were kids because we could always take a pattern of numbers, two, four, six, eight, 10, but that's essentially what's going on with the generative AI. So this is early 2023. That's what we know as generative AI. And by the way, we won't be this basic the whole time. But today, I can take that same statement and say, what should bankers be prepared for with AI technology? And G chat GPT or open AI in the background takes that short sentence and then predicts the most likely answer to that. And now we get this whole um, basically predicted text based on a short question. And that's really what we're talking about with generative predictive AI. 
And that's what um, that's where we're at now. And, and we have this access to so much more information. So here's another thing that I was just messing with recently. Um, some of you might be familiar with Dolly 3, which is an open AI tool that does image generation. They also have a vid video generation tool that's coming out soon as well that uh, I'm not sure it's going to make it into our hands before it goes through Holly uh, Hollywood first. But specifically on this example is an image of a frustrated banker. So old school. The way that I would have done this a few months ago is I would have went into Google and I would have typed in Google images and give me an image of a frustrated banker. And I would have hit send. And then next thing you know, it's going to take me to a page. I was like, I like this one. I'll click on this one. It brings this over up over here. I want that image. I go to that image and I find out that it's protected. So um, a lot of what we do in Google is really... Um, as we know, it's really directing us based on paid type um, direction. So I went through that whole process only to find out the image I liked was actually behind a paywall at Shutterstock. So, um, but that's the old school. And there's other ways I would have ultimately gotten to finding the image that somebody else produced of a frustrated banker. So, but today, and this is what I did the other day for this meeting today, early 2024, what, what I did is I just went into uh, chat GPT and I said, create an image of a confused banker. And I, I made it a little harder that has lost the team's trust. So now I have a confused banker here, the team's lost, but I was like, well, I kind of wanted a woman. So let me just ask it to do a woman. So it takes that same image and it says, uh, I'll just make this person a woman. Now I look at that and said, make the confused banker. And I'm going to pause this here. Um, where's that at? Pause that. Make the confusion based on fear of or lack of understanding of AI, meaning they don't adapt. So here's an image that I wanted to, I wanted ChatGPT to create an image that has a frustrated group behind the banker that's unwilling to adopt the new technology. So um, let's just keep generating here. And now I said, you know, I think the team should be a little bit bigger. So um, I looked at this one. It gave me the frustrated banker. I got the team. I was like, I think we need a larger team because the leader's impact is far more than four people. So now I told it to give me an image with more people keeping the frustrated banker. And here's what it created. So now this was all dynamic. It, it took me about, what, five, maybe 10 minutes to do this, probably. Um, and that was with distractions because I was doing it at night while one of the basketball games was on. Um, so, so that's kind of a neat technology. Again, this is the technology um, that we're witnessing today that's available. So what just happened was there was an image progression. I said, create a confused banker, followed by frustrated employees and then lack of leadership around AI. And this is what we came up with. Now, this is really to illustrate that the, um, the technological capabilities are dramatically different than just, just a few months ago or six months or a year ago. So think about this in the context of image generation, but now say, is the same thing happening in virtually every area of my business? And the answer to that question is most likely yes. The question then is, is how can I embrace this technology? Because this image generation has probably got the folks at Shutterstock a bit nervous, but the same technology can invade other aspects of your business. So this is why I say we're experiencing a quantum leap and I'm applying this just to strategic planning and execution. And, and, and that's where we're gonna go from here. So why don't we apply this in part three to artificial intelligence in strategy? So we're not gonna veer off this the rest of the way. We're gonna focus on strategy again. We're gonna use Southwest Airlines as an example for this first part. So this is Southwest Airlines um, and it's basically a strategic planning process. So, and I'm gonna illustrate how we can today read and summarize more data than we ever thought possible. I'll actually show you this. So this is a Southwest Airlines preparing for strategic planning. So the first thing is, is it's taking nine documents. So I've got nine documents that I, that I took. These are internal and external documents. So think of this as planning for strategic planning. And you take those documents, you drop them into ChatGPT. ChatGPT uploads these files. Now I have nine documents, um, something like 400 pages in here. And then I say, give this thing some direction. And I say, hey, ChatGPT, take those documents only 
and give me specific, I'm giving it specific direction to summarize the organization's culture, determine five external impacts and three areas for strategic focus. And ChatGPT went into those documents and pulled out that information. I won't go into the specific output, but you can see what it did. Now, most of us think of ChatGPT as asking this um, little you know, genie in the bottle a question, and it gives us an answer from external information. So pause for a second here. What we just did is ChatGPT actually was only looking at the information that was loaded. So what does this mean to a business? So if a business has internal reports, um, external analysis on the banking industry, um, various different things like that, all of these things can now be captured, loaded in the chat GPT, and then say, give me X, Y, or Z. And that's what we're doing here. This isn't asking and a large language model to give me an answer. This is asking to summarize information that I have at my disposal. I just need to load it in there. So pretty cool thing there. So again, ChatGPT read more than 400 pages of information. It summarized, uh, summarized it in 250 words on culture, external factors, and three strategic focus areas. And it did this in less than one minute. And I ask you, if you have one employee that can do that, you should probably give them a raise. If you have 10 employees that can do that, give them all a raise. If you have 100 employees that can do that, you should give all of them a raise. But we don't need any of those employees to do that. And that's what's scary right now. Um, this can be done so rapidly without the biasness that exists with people interpreting data, because this is, this is an AI interpreting the data. So... Let's take it a step further. We're all familiar with the SWOT analysis or the SWOT table, whatever we want to call it. So now I'm going to take Southwest Airlines. Again, we loaded, I loaded nine files in there. And now I'm going to direct ChatGPT or AI to pull out some information from those files, not from an, a large language model, from those files to come up with a SWOT for, for uh, Southwest. So that's what I did at the bottom. I gave it a prompt gave it some directions and said, just prepare me a SWOT using those documents. So now it's rereading those documents, um, looking at all of those nine documents. It's putting all that information and now putting it into a framework called a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And uh, so many of us had said, hey, let's get a SWOT analysis from every department. Um, and then we get together and we talk about it. But really, we can actually create a SWOT analysis by using internal documents that represents the consolidated effort for the entire organization, if done correctly. So all of this can be done fairly, fairly um, efficiently at the same time. So now let's take it a step further. I mentioned the balance scorecard earlier. The balance scorecard is a framework for setting up KPIs. And we've all heard of KPIs. Actually, the acronym Key Performance um, Index, is that Key Performance Indices? I forget. Either way. But that KPI came from the balance scorecard. So now what we're going to do is take those same files that we uploaded and say, give me the balance scorecard for Southwest Airlines. So uh, that's the direction or the prompt. We're saying, give me the, the four areas, financial, customer, internal, and learning and growth. And the specific direction was, give me a, a balanced scorecard. ChatGPT said, okay, cool, I'm gonna give you two. So it starts giving me two responses. I'm gonna pick one. Um, I'll pick one and I'll go with it. So it'll just click on that. But essentially what we have here is a, is a balanced scorecard for Southwest. And I said, let's take it a step further Give me KPIs for the customer perspective. And now what it's doing, it's taking that and it's giving me 10 KPIs. Now, these KPIs would need to be altered or modified for your organization. But this isn't AI telling us what to do. This is AI interpreting from the data we gave it um, what we want it to do. So now you remain in control. So what just happened? ChatGPT read more than 400 pages. Again, it applied the internal and external information, those, those nine files. It built the SWOT. It developed the balanced scorecard, and it created KPIs for one of the perspective in less than 15 minutes. And the greatest uh, bottleneck was my ability to type in there, not its ability to analyze. So that's where we're at right now. 
and uh, pretty crazy stuff that we can do that's really, really fun if you like this thing called planning in business. So um, summary, uh, the AI had, gives us the ability to reference and analyze substantial amounts of data and reports. Um, it's not just asking ChatGPT questions. It's using our own information in order to analyze that. Summarizes and synthesizes internal and, and external information. It interprets it using various different frameworks based on your direction. And you can now start layering, going deeper into desired topics that you want to dig deeper into. So I'll pause for a quick second, and then we're going to transition into the next part. So right now, we, we, we talked about what we can do right now. You could get off this 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 uh, webinar and do this right now in chat GPT. I should qualify. I have the $20 a month uh, version of chat GPT. So um, some of you might not have that. So it's um, it, it's the $20 a month that gives me access to GPT-4, um, which is gives me the ability to do this. So um, probably a nice investment. Um, so let's move on the next wave of strategy. So now we start looking at strategy. I start looking at it differently. So I've always thought, as I mentioned earlier, that strategy can be this connective tissue within an organization if we just include more people. But I struggled for nearly a decade trying to figure out a way to create a more inclusive process for people in the organization to participate in building that organization. Because we know what we build, we take greater pride and ownership in. So the next wave of strategy really goes down this path. So what we just did, the AI improves the analysis, summarization, and synthesis of data and reports. Really cool. And this is all focused on enhancing productivity. Now we have to think about what do we do in business? We're always so hyper-focused on productivity. And, and, and we've been trained to do this, but with this cr um, crazy emphasis on pro productivity, we lost our ability to connect. So essentially what I believe um, statement-wise is that we have sacrificed connectivity for an over-concentration on productivity. And what we found is that when people lack connectivity, productivity falls. And we've been seeing a um, fairly uh, consistent drop in productivity over the past several years as we've seen a corresponding drop in connectivity within the organization. So many of you probably aren't even in HR, but if I was in HR, I would be saying, hey, why don't we increase connectivity so that we can enhance productivity because these things are closely linked and I would even go so far to say they're blended. So how do we use AI to take us to another level through strategic planning to create greater connectivity within an organization? That's a question we don't usually ask ourselves, but let's ask it for the moment because the technology is being able, is now able to answer that. Essentially what we're doing is we're giving everyone a voice in the organization's future, which is kind of cool. If we could do that, we would have done it a long time ago, but it's really, really hard. So I'm gonna go through this fictitious company called First National Bank. There might even be somebody from a First National Bank on the line here. I apologize, but that's kind of a generic name for a bank. So I, I did that. And then I had AI come up with a logo. So that logo, FNB, First National Bank, is a logo generated by AI, similar to the path we went down earlier. So this is a fictitious company, right? And what we're going to do here is use this software. And this, by the way, um, you know, uh, this is our software we developed. If there was another software application out there, I would show it. But right now, there's nobody applying this technological capability to the use case of planning and execution. So this, we'll just go through this, ignore that it's our software, but just I'm just illustrating the technological capabilities for planning that will ultimately include more people in the process, creating greater connectivity that leads to enhanced productivity. So company focus here, AI conducts dynamic strategy interviews with employees. So if you could, wouldn't it be awesome if we could have a full comprehensive interview with as many employees as we want? Here, I'm going to show you that AI has the ability to play the role of a seasoned strategy consultant. So what happens here in this strategy 360 is the AI will take somebody and they'll go through this process. And there's, there's basically 
eight segments of this strategy interview that they go through. And it's, it's going around the wheel right here talking about the segments or the topics. And the AI is going to ask questions and then it's going to score the person's answers relative to their contribution. So this is where the AI starts asking questions over there on the right in color. And then you, the person, the, inner, the employee provides an answer. The AI has the ability to adapt the next question based on the answer. So here's a second question. And usually, and we call this layering in sales. We, we ask a question from that question, we go deeper. The AI is trained to layer and go deeper and change the direction of the conversation. Now it goes through this and it's a, a full log of an interview. So this is an interview that probably takes about an hour and um, 5,000 words or 15 pages. I copied and pasted into a Word document. So this specific interview for Robbie Relationship Manager was about 5,000 words and it's summarized there too. So then we go, okay, where does this information go? Now Robbie, the Relationship Manager, goes in here and he works for, um, or she, because it's an I, she works for... Um, First National Bank, here's her interview placed into a strategy framework we call the strategy whiteboard, right? So um, I was talking really fast. So let me just review what we just did there. So um, the AI led a strategy 360 interview. So each individual employee um, goes through a strategy 360 interview that is roughly an hour, hour and a half. It can be as long as you want, but they're conversing with, having dialogue with an AI that is playing the role of a professional seasoned strategy consultant that has the ability to drive the conversation a certain way. Many of you might be thinking, well, that's just a questionnaire. Well, it's actually quite different. A questionnaire are canned questions that everybody answers and they provide generally short answers. This is dialogue between an AI and a person, and the AI adapts to that person. Some of you say, well, is it an assessment? Is it like, you know, a um, some sort of a culture assessment or something like that? No, I mean, a culture assessment or any assessment basically takes the English language and boils it down to one through seven. This is a full comprehensive 5,000 word interview. Now, we have the ability to do something with this information, these 5,000 words, right? So AI-led strategy, 300, strategy 360, we just had one employee there, but it could be multiple employees, right? Um, um, so the AI then adapted the conversation, like I said, and then it takes that information and they create a mini strategic plan, basically, for each employee based on the responses. And this is how we give every employee a voice. And when we give people a voice in strategy, what happens is, is they take greater ownership in the outcomes. That's what we're trying to do here. So let's go through another example here. And this is the data analysis or synthesis side. So it's taking that. So if we had 5,000 words and 50 employees doing this, that's 250,000 words, which really means nothing other than it's a lot. That's 750 words, excuse me, pages, 750 pages of data. Let's go give that to an analyst and say, make some sense out of that. Good luck, right? Or a team of an analysts. Um, however, that's 750 pages. I wrote a book about strategy and it was 300 pages. It took me a long time to write that book. 750 pages of rich data that came from the heads or the minds of the people that are closest to your customer. That's valuable information. Now, what do we do with it? We analyze it and synthesize it. So how does technology help us with that? We use the strategy whiteboard framework. I discussed several other frameworks. We're using the strategy whiteboard framework here. Um, you can apply this to a lot of different strategy frameworks. So what we're gonna go through here is a quick illustration of how AI analyzes and synthesizes these interviews into a strategic plan. So specifically here, it's going to go down into the strategy whiteboard. And basically what it did, it took all of the interviews and put it into a strategic planning format. It identified the organization's culture based on all of these interviews. It looked out and said, give me the external impacts and inspiration from the employees. What's the internal strengths and weaknesses? That's kind of a SWOT analysis if you haven't picked up on that, which I'm sure you did. What's your strategic foundation, your foundational strategy, unifying objective, core competency statement, all these things. And you can go into any of these and change them, right? So this is all, all technology to this point. And then we come down to 
are what we call focus lenses, customer, product, operations, and people. So these are strategic focus and outcomes. And the AI took all of those interviews and created a clear customer focus statement or a vision statement for the organization's customer focus. And then specific outcomes, KPIs, metrics, goals around our customer, our product, same thing, a clear customer, or excuse me, product focus statement. Now, this is not meant to be your strategic plan for an organization. It's meant to feed your strategic plan. So now you have essentially a completely analyzed, synthesized strategic plan based on the input of your employees. And it looks at all of these different angles um, within this context here. Now, again, this is not meant to be your strategic plan. It's meant to enhance your strategic plan. It's up to the leadership team now to take this rich data that's been taken or, or mined from your people, consolidated, summarized, and put into a framework, and now make decisions. Now, now leadership can make real decisions based on the input of the human beings that work for this organization. And that's what I might mean by giving everyone a voice. It's, it's absolutely cool that we can now touch everybody in the organization. So the AI analyzed, summarized, and synthesized each interview, right? And again, that can be 50 interviews or, or whatever. Um, it adapted the information into the strategy whiteboard framework. You can figure out the framework you want to use. It did strategic analysis, identified strat uh, strategic focus. It developed clear strategic outcomes in a smart goal format. Um, all technology. So the human side of this, let's just say you had 50 people. The human side of this is the humans answering questions. The technology takes care of everything else, right? Let's take it one more example here is AI becoming a strategy consultant. So this is another example of how we can start asking the AI questions about various different things. So we've got our little cute bot down here in the left-hand corner, and uh, we'll just go to that. The left-hand corner, and that's a bot. We call this bot Fusion, and we're going to ask Fusion a question. What is a strategic outcome? Like, I don't know what it is. Just tell me what it is. Behind the scenes here, we've created a what's called a corpus of data. So this isn't going out to OpenAI's um, LLM. We have a it's, a it's a corpus of specific data to answer specific questions around strategy. Um, so we said, give me an example of a strategic of, of a um, strategic outcome. And it did. I just highlighted it up there. Increase our market share in the personal loan sector from 10% to 15%. Then I said, what is a core competency statement? I don't know. I don't expect everybody to know this stuff, right? So it, it gives me the definition of what it is. And I was like, well, that's a nice definition, but give me an example. So even better, I said, give me two examples here. Give me two examples of a core competency statement. So the AI runs through this or Fusion, our good friend Fusion runs Fuses, runs through this uh, tech company specializing in AI. There's an example there or a manufacturing of an eco-friendly packaging, manufacturer of eco-friendly packaging company. That's really cool, but I'm a banker. I want to know how it relates to banking. Can you give me an example for the banking industry? So give me a core competency statement for a bank. So now it goes, okay, cool. Let me adapt everything I know and put it into your language. And it creates a core competency statement. Now I'm using core competency statement, but it could be virtually anything here. So essentially what has happened is the AI can now provide specific advice to support your strategic planning to help you better prepare that. So um, what just happened again, the AI played the role of a strategy consultant. It answered questions. It provided specific examples based on your needs. So this is where we're going with this. this. Um, pretty cool. So um, we're, we're about ready to close this out, but I just want to make a comparison. So the way we did strategic planning yesterday versus today. So here's two examples. One is a large company, strategic planning, and two is a mid-sized company. Um, you know, it starts at some point, there's a level of research, it goes all the way across, but a large company strategic planning process. Now, I didn't make these up. These are specific examples. The large company one, I'm thinking of a specific oil and gas company that went through a process with McKinsey and company. It took nine months. It was two and a half million dollar engagement. And this is essentially what they did. I wouldn't suggest anybody do that. Now, if we said, well, we, that's not our space, we're more of a mid-sized company. 
we look at this strategic planning is probably going to take at least two months if you condense everything down. Um, and it looks like, you know, in this case, they were interviewing on the large company, um, interviewing 15 executives, and then on the small company or mid-sized company, they were interviewing six. Now let's take this to the new world and what just happened today. So today we can do everything in that nine month process and more rather than interviewing 15 executives, we can interview as many people as you want in the organization. I mean, I'm just saying technology can do this. Um, it can do all of that stuff and your whole strategic planning process theoretically could be condensed to two weeks, which is crazy if you think about it. Um, so, and then you have to execute it too. So that's the whole other process. So creating seamless execution of strategy, which is a whole methodology I'm not getting into today. But um, so let's look at this for a second. So embrace AI for better planning and execution. If you do that, what's the benefits to your organization? Um, clearly there's a lot on the, on the um, productivity side, less time, less money, participation. But this idea around shared direction again, not sharing direction, but shared direction, shared ownership, um, agile, agility, all these things come into play because if we can plan quickly, we can then adapt quickly. In a world that changes rapidly, planning is only as good as the rate of change outside. So we can, we can now, if we can plan quickly, again, we can now get people together and make really fast decisions and then adapt really quickly. Um, and that's what we're looking for. And ultimately, when we include more people and in, we enrich the culture of the organization. So if you're a strategy leader or you're leading some relevant um, part of strategy in an organization, you'll end up needing to have a deeper knowledge and understanding um, of what's going on. Um, so how do we adapt this? How do we use these tools? Um, strategy leaders, I believe, must leverage technology in order to stay ahead of the curve. Um, we have to be more efficient with the planning process, and we have to be able to engage more people in the process because that's going to help our culture. It's also going to help our outcomes. We have to be open to alternative viewpoints. This seems um, kind of obvious, but really, historically, you know, 10 people have really guided the direction of an organization over the past X number of years. But now when we open it up to, you know, I had Tony the teller on there. When we open up giving Tony the teller the opportunity to provide input into the company strategy, we have to be open to these alternative viewpoints. Um, we create agility and we have to adapt. Um, we have to release control and really lead from behind. And really we start, or excuse me, we end where we started and we ultimately have to pick a side here. And um, that's where we're at here. Which side are you on? Embrace or be replaced, beginning, um, closing out here. So I'll open it up to questions. We have about 10 minutes.